Hello and welcome to the Atlas Agency, a channel all about Arkham Horror, the card game. I'm your host Brandon, back today with something a little different, taking a look ahead at an upcoming release for the game. On June 3rd, 2019, Fantasy Flight Games announced the Dream Eaters Deluxe Box, which will kick off the fifth expansion cycle for Arkham Horror the Card Game. We're still a little ways off from the first release of Dream Eaters, but I'm very much looking forward to this cycle, and I wanted to do a video sort of looking ahead to it. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about what we know so far about Dream Eaters, engaging in a little speculation on what may be in store, and sharing some of the things that have me personally excited for the cycle, as well as some things I'm hesitant about. I hope you enjoy it! In a previous video that I did for the Guardians of the Abyss scenario pack, I talked about how I really wanted something in the Arkham product line to fill the middle ground between a full eight scenario campaign and a standalone scenario. Some kind of product still in campaign mode, but with a shorter three to four scenario campaign. At that point, Guardians of the Abyss, with its two linked scenarios, was the closest thing we'd had to anything like that, but still quite far off from what I was envisioning. I was looking for some kind of self-contained three to four scenario box set, outside the normal flow of Arkham's expansion cycles, and similar maybe to the saga boxes of the Lord of the Rings LCG. Funnily enough, I think I called this my dream product in that video. The good news is that sometimes dreams do come true, and I guess the bad news is apparently they can also be eaten by nightmarish half-human, half-spider abominations. In the initial announcement for the Dream Eaters, we learned that rather than being a traditional eight scenario campaign, this cycle would instead consist of two different four scenario campaigns. The deluxe expansion will include the first scenario for each of these campaigns, and then both campaigns will be continued over the six Mythos packs of the cycle, with the individual releases alternating between the two campaigns. One campaign, titled the Dream Quest, will cover a journey into the dreamlands of H.P. Lovecraft's Dream Cycle stories, while the other campaign, which I don't think we know the name of yet, will cover related events taking place in the waking world, with the option to combine both of these mini-campaigns into a cohesive eight-part campaign, though we don't yet know the finer points of exactly how that will work and how the events of the two campaigns will interweave if you do play both. While I think it may be a little awkward playing this cycle over the initial course of its release, just due to the slow pacing with the releases alternating between campaigns, and especially with the deluxe box having just one scenario for each campaign, I'm nonetheless tremendously excited about the fact that the finished product will give us not just one, but two mini campaigns for the game. It's basically just what I was hoping for, but doubled. It's not quite in the format I expected, but I'm not bothered at all by it occupying the space of a normal cycle, and if it's well received, I think it might even open the door for future products with mini campaigns. Sort of a side note, I'm not super optimistic that this will happen, but I do think it would be nice if one of the two halves of Dream Eaters was a relatively beginner-friendly experience, something that could maybe hold up as an alternative to Night of the Zealot for introducing new players to the game. There are parts of the Zealot experience that I think don't always make it a great ambassador for the game. I don't think that's an uncommon opinion. The Devourer below especially can wind up souring people on really the whole game. I would love to have one of the Dream Eaters mini campaigns be something I could break out to introduce the game with a little more confidence. I don't want both mini campaigns to be like that, of course, but if just one of the two were, then I think that would be useful. Again, I'm not really that confident that that'll happen. I think it would be nice, though. In addition to presenting us with this novel campaign structure, I think Dream Eaters is also interesting from the thematic perspective. Now, we've seen that every cycle in Arkham approaches the mythos with a somewhat different genre filter, whether that's the gothic horror of The Circle Undone, the pulp adventure of The Forgotten Age, the unreliable narration and uncertainty of the path to Carcosa, or just the weird horror of the Dunwich legacy. But the Dream Eaters, or at least the half that's set in the Dreamlands, will feature what should be one of the most unique modes we've seen to date, the weird fantasy story. The Dream Eaters is inspired by a subset of H.P. Lovecraft's fiction that's referred to as his Dream Cycle. The most famous of these stories, and the longest, is the novella The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. It's the story of a man, Randolph Carter, who's captivated at the sight of a fantastic city he keeps glimpsing in his dreams, who sets off on a quest through a dimension called the Dreamlands in order to find that city. The Dreamlands is basically its own fantasy world, accessible to humans through dreams, with numerous regions, cities, and monstrous inhabitants. Outside of the dream quest of Unknown Kadath, 
There are numerous shorter works that are considered to be part of Lovecraft's dream cycle, though Dream Quest itself seems to do most of the work when it comes to synthesizing the elements of the dream cycle stories into a unified setting. I've spent the last couple of weeks familiarizing myself with these stories, putting together my Explore the Lore playlist for the cycle, and Dream Eaters is certainly going to set the record for the longest bibliography for an Arkham cycle. I think I'm up to at least 20 stories at this point. And the Dream Cycle stories are very different from the tales that probably first come to mind when you think of Lovecraft, even though they do share some elements and entities with those stories. It's sort of like going to Narnia, but meeting Narlathotep when you get there. I think it has the potential to be an interesting departure from the normal tone of the game. We're coming off what I think of as a fairly dark cycle. Circle Undone was certainly bleak in its outlook and often in its artwork as well, especially in the spectral realm. In the Dreamlands, I think we'll see quite the opposite brightly lit, fantasy-like environments, at least some of the time, and that's already borne out in some of the preview images that we've seen. We're also going from one of the most localized cycles, with almost all the action in Circle Undone set within Arkham itself, to one that literally has a whole new world to explore. And while I am really excited about this cycle being split into the two campaigns, I do think an unfortunate potential downside to that structure is the fact that it's probably going to leave us less space for the cycle to explore the Dreamland setting. With one of the cycle's two campaigns being set primarily in the waking world, that leaves us with only four scenarios set within the Dreamlands, and I definitely think there are enough places in the Dreamlands setting to populate a full eight scenario campaign. I'd like to go through some speculation here about the content of the two campaigns, and about which parts of the Dreamlands we may be visiting in the Dream Quest campaign. This is based mostly on the previews we've had so far, and also on the Mythos Pack names, which have all already been spoiled. It's just educated guesses, but if you'd prefer not to be spoiled at all, you may want to skip ahead. So the first scenario of the Dream Quest is called Beyond the Gates of Sleep. It looks like this one will basically parallel the initial entry into the Dreamlands from the story, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. With the Cavern of Flame, the 700 steps down to the Gate of Deeper Slumber, the Enchanted Wood, and of course the Zoogs. All of those elements can be seen in the first announcement article for the Deluxe Box. That seems like plenty of material, so I would guess it probably won't go too much further into the Dreamlands than that. I'm looking forward to this one. I think it's pretty cool to parallel the beginning of Dream Quest, and I think the Zoogs are pretty fun as well. They're these sort of alien-looking, I guess rodent-like creatures. Felicia Kano, or Kano, is the artist who illustrated several of the Zoogs for the Call of Cthulhu LCG, and I've always really, really liked those pieces. They're sort of morbid, but cute at the same time. Definitely a departure from the typical Arkham monster that we're used to seeing. I remember when the Arkham LCG plugin for the Strange Aeons card creation program first came out. I was just messing around and never made a real scenario out of it, but I did pull a bunch of the Zoog artwork into the program just to have some inspiration to build some cards around. So I'm looking forward to seeing a real scenario built around those guys. Scenario 2 in the Dream Quest is the Search for Kadath. This one's already been previewed, and the preview article shows it follows a larger scale. I hesitate to say the word global because I'm not sure the Dreamlands are round, but it has location cards that represent entire cities and regions of the Dreamlands. That does give the campaign the opportunity to include more of the lore and locations of the space, but it's in a much shallower capacity. I do think it's a fine approach for incorporating certain parts of the Dreamland's lore, like, for example, Dream Cycle stories like The Doom That Came to Sarnath, that are fun to reference, but that maybe don't necessarily warrant an entire scenario. It looks like this scenario may be similar to Dim Carcosa, where the backs of locations are devoted to story text, which again, uh, helps the scenario pay tribute to those stories. If I'm matching up the Mythos Pack titles to the two campaigns correctly, it looks like Scenario 3 of the Dream Quest is Dark Side of the Moon. The moon is a place within the Dreamlands, accessible by ship, complete with monstrous moon beasts, so I expect that this scenario is going to focus on that setting. And then the last scenario is Where the Gods Dwell. It sounds like that one will be set in Kadath itself for the finale, so most of the exploration of the different locations within the Dreamlands is going to be confined to that second scenario, the one with the global scale. As I said, I do think that's the right approach for some of the locations, and I'm glad that there's a scenario that operates at that scale, but I do think there are some other places that would be worth exploring more fully, including Ulthar, Celeface, the Underworld, and the Plateau of Lang. So I see that as the biggest downside to the mini-campaign structure. As far as the second campaign, the one set in the real world, as I mentioned before, unless I missed it somewhere, I don't think we even know the name of this one yet, or the name of its first scenario, we do have its other three scenarios titles. They are A Thousand Shapes of Horror, Point of No Return, 
and Weaver of the Cosmos. Based on that last title and the cover art for the cycle, I'm guessing this campaign will somewhat mirror the plot of the Atlak Nacha Ancient One from Eldritch Horror. The flavor text on that Ancient One card reads, Ever weaving, ever watching, should Atlak Nacha ever complete her Empyrean masterpiece, it would merge the firmaments of the Dreamlands and reality into a single cosmic ingress, opening the way for the horrors of the underworld to wage war upon the cities of humanity. That sounds like a pretty good pattern for this campaign, keeping the monsters of the Dreamlands underworld from spilling over into the real world. I don't think we have a lot to go on at this point as far as gameplay themes within these two campaigns, or hints as to how the campaigns might feel different from each other. The announcement for this cycle didn't have any big keyword mechanics to reveal, like Vengeance or Haunted or Hidden. Search for Kadath gives us Veiled, but that looks to be specific to the location cards in that one scenario. I wonder if, in Dream Quest, we may find parley abilities to be a little more common than usual. The Dreamlands has cities and civilizations that can be interacted with, and some of the creatures there are perhaps a little more personable than we're used to, so you may want to put on your Sunday best fine clothes before you start dreaming. That's just speculation, though, just kind of based on the characters and events in some of the Dreamland stories, and that's about all I have on possible gameplay themes. There's just not a lot to go on at the moment there. Moving on from talking about the new campaigns, a new cycle of course brings a new host of player cards, and on that side of things, the thing I'm looking forward to most with Dream Eaters is that it seems like we'll be seeing some interesting experimentation with the structure of player cards, in part through the bonded mechanic. Our first bonded cards actually came in at the very end of the Circle Undone, but it looks like bonded is going to be explored a little further in Dream Eaters. Basically, bonded cards are cards that start outside of your deck, they are called into your deck by certain other cards that you play, like the Hallowed Mirror from Before the Black Throne that, when played, pulls in three copies of the bonded card Soothing Melody. We've had a preview for one card in the Dream Eaters Deluxe Box that uses bonded, and in a way that's quite different from the bonded cards in Before the Black Throne. I think there's a lot of potential for cool stuff with bonded cards, so I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. There's also a new player card keyword visible in one of the card fans in the initial announcement article. That keyword is Myriad, and if I had to guess based on the name and the card it appears on, I think Myriad will end up being a little bit like Android Netrunner's consumer grade cards. Normally a Netrunner you could have up to three copies of a card in your deck, whereas the consumer grade cards allowed you to run up to six copies and were generally cards where you benefited from having multiple copies of the same card in play. And of course, each pack came with the full six copies of each of those cards. That seems like a plausible match with what we see on Open Gate, especially with the text saying there's a group limit of three of these cards in play. This is all just guesswork. I don't think we've seen anywhere confirmation of what Myriad does, but I think this is a pretty good bet. So that would be another mechanic potentially toying around with the normal structure for player cards. So together, these two mechanics, Myriad and Bonded, may give a unique, maybe more unconventional feel to the cycle's player card space. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is a new practice that Fantasy Flight has started with this cycle's releases, and one that I'm unfortunately not that fond of. Beginning with the Dream Eaters as a bonus for pre-ordering Arkham expansions directly through Fantasy Flight's own website, Fantasy Flight has begun including bonus sets of 5x7 art prints featuring artwork from the game. These have been featured in the announcements for the Dream Eaters Deluxe Box, the first Mythos pack, and the upcoming Murder at the Excelsior Hotel standalone scenario. I would assume they're going to continue these throughout the cycle, and it seems to be part of a general marketing trend at FFG. I've seen at least one other non-Arkham product, I think it was an Elf. 5R RPG supplement that had these offered as well. It's eight prints with a deluxe box and four with the Mythos pack, but you only get these art prints by pre-ordering these expansions directly from Fantasy Flight. Now it feels awkward to complain about other people receiving free stuff, and I'll try to keep this brief, but I'm disappointed with this practice. I've gotten art prints before with some of the non-standard Arkham products that I've purchased direct from Fantasy Flight over the years, like for example the Arkham Calendar, and I think they're really cool. I like getting them. I've actually decorated some of my gaming space with a few of them, but for regular Arkham releases, I'm extremely satisfied with my existing retailer, and as much as I would like to get these prints, I'm not going to drop my retailer and switch to ordering off the Fantasy Flight website over this. I know some people will, so it just seems like kind of a crummy thing to do to game stores. It's not the end of the world, these aren't game components, they're more or less just Arkham postcards, but still, I'll say I'm mildly annoyed by this. I wish there was a way for retailers to be able to offer these as well. 
And that's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed this look ahead to the Dream Eaters cycle. Let me know in the comments what you're looking forward to seeing in Dream Eaters. And as always, thanks for watching the Atlas Agency. I ended up taking sort of an unexpected break over the last few months, but hopefully you'll be seeing more from me over the coming months. I'm trying to get back into the rhythm of doing regular video content. Until next time, good luck in your own investigations of the mythos.